Let me welcome you all to another session of Renewing the African Mindset. Uh, this is a platform uh, where we share ideas and um, experiences. It's uh, RAM, Renewing the African Mindset, was established in 2012 uh, in order for uh, Africans in the diaspora, as well as Africans back home all over the world, for us to uh, sort of like engage with one another, is also an open forum for topical issues affecting the Nigerian, the African diaspora. And it's a way of um, acculturating the African mindset uh, in the Western host countries without losing the African identity. And another uh, objective of RAM is actually to ensure that we create awareness and highlight the differences between the African and the Western cultures, promotes success stories of Africans in the diaspora as well. Welcome everybody. Today we're talking about human trafficking. This is a huge one, especially given the uh, current climate we're in. Um, this is COVID-19. Everybody is on lockdown. And we do realize that there's so many things going on behind closed doors. So human trafficking is a big issue, which has been for, some, for a number of years. However, during this lockdown, people are suffering in silence. And we believe that this is an issue that we need to talk about in the open. How do we eradicate human trafficking? What makes people to go into human trafficking? Why are people subjecting themselves um, to the sort of treat, treatment meted out to them by perpetrators and the various agencies across the world, or should I say, especially within Africa, where we do have uh, this uh, situation going on all the time, that these different agencies, what did they do to sort of like curb this um, Crime, I would say it's a crime because when you're trafficking human beings and then they get to the other side of where they're supposed to be going to, they're thinking of greener pastures only for them to be treated as slaves, either sex slaves even, or uh, some people die in the process. So at the end of it all, it's not like finding out that the uh, grass is greener on the other side. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the guest that I have this afternoon. Um, with us. So um, the first person I'm going to uh, uh, introduce to us is a lady who is the Director General of one of the agencies in Nigeria trying to curb this crime of human trafficking. She's the Director General of National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, otherwise known as NAPTIP. And this agency is one of the agencies under the supervision of the Federal Ministry of Justice in Nigeria. The person I'd like to introduce to you today is no other than Dame Julie Oka Donley. Dame Julie, good afternoon, good afternoon and welcome to Thank you RAM. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, tell us a bit about your agency, NAPTIP. Well, NAPTIP is um, the federal government's response to right. fight human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, it is a law enforcement agency that has very wide powers. We have the power to arrest, to prosecute, and uh, you know, in between all of this, we carry out um, awareness campaigns. We have the powers to raise awareness mm -hmm. um, in the country. Uh, then we also um, have... Um, the powers as well to rehabilitate um, victims of um, trafficking. Uh, we, we are, our agency is a very unique agency um, in the sense that we don't only arrest and prosecute the perpetrators, we also uh, rehabilitate the victims and empower them so they can be better um, citizens to themselves and to the society at the end of the day. And the, the, the agency is now under the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. We used to be under the Ministry of Justice, mm -hmm. uh, but recently we were moved to the um, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Could you tell me, you know, um, what, how would you uh, define human trafficking? Well, human trafficking can be defined as that act, you know, of recruiting, you know, people or persons, you know, with the objective of enslaving them, to exploit them. Mm -hmm. There are different ways, you know, you have to recruit them, you know, you transport them, 
there's somebody who harbors them and then of course there's somebody who receives them and then of course for the, the, the at the end of the day the aim is to exploit them the exploitation could take the form of sexual exploitation mm -hmm. um, labor exploitation organ harvesting and mm -hmm. so on and so forth mm -hmm. so the, the, those are the dimensions of uh, human trafficking i guess yes. you see um also in this uh situation of human trafficking i'm sure you do, your agency faced challenges as well what are the challenges faced by your agency especially when it involves um high personal personalities uh within the country if they're involved in such a case what are what, what do you think are the challenges faced so be honest with you, I thought you were going to ask about the challenges um, faced by us when it comes to the victims, not the high personality, because in mm. Nancy, there's no high or low personality. That's what we like to hear. The criminal is the criminal. I don't care who you are, where you come from. I mm. prosecute, I go after you, and that's it. I don't, um, I'm, not, I'm not intimidated by anybody, and that's just the truth. Okay, thank you, because a lot of people always have problems with that, you know, when uh, these personalities are involved, forgetting that the, 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 the whole essence of uh, establishing the agency is to protect the victims and to ensure that the perpetrators are, you know, prosecuted. So it, it, it's good to hear that from you. And also, let me just ask one question. Can you enlighten us about uh, NAPTIP's response to COVID-19 case, uh, you know, the COVID-19 crisis with regards to trafficked victims and um, how they could be rescued under your agency? Okay, fantastic. Um, hmm. Right now, there's a committee that was inaugurated by my minister, Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, and um, I happen to be the chairperson of the Humanitarian Intervention Committee. Mm -hmm. um, we've done some mapping out to find out how many shelters we have where we have traffic victims all over Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And um, we're al already working towards sending palliatives to all victims of trafficking right now who mm -hmm. are in, um, in, in various shelters you right. know, to, to take these palliatives to them. Then um, when it comes to victims of violence right now because right now trafficking has been has been put on kind of on hold uh, we have more of uh, cases of violence we arrest and of course we um, rescue victims of violence so that's what we are doing right now so everybody is going to be taken care of in terms of palliatives okay um there's also one other question i'd like to ask with regards to the uh, palliatives you mentioned there are concerns about the uh, present database being used by the government to uh, to provide palliatives at this time do you have any record of uh, you know or statistics of these vulnerable persons uh in nigeria well that question i really cannot answer because it's a question that should go to my minister and um, she has had cause to answer the question at various fora. And she says, look, this program started some time ago. Not before COVID-19, there was a program that was going on, the school feeding program and then um, other programs like that, where you give um, a vulnerable people some money. And then um, they obviously have a, a, a database which they will keep updating from time to time. Yeah, okay. One last question I have for you right now. What future do you envisage post-COVID-19? Well, post-COVID-19, I believe that um, if we are not very aggressive in fighting human trafficking in terms of raising awareness and making people realize that there's going to be, this time around, there's going to be more of online recruitment. Unlike the, before, where people were physically seen taking victims out, now recruitment is going to be massively online, where they're going to be offering people you know, mouth-watering offers for jobs abroad. Reason being that the destination countries are the worst hit. They are the worst hit, and they are going to definitely need labor. And of course, where are they going to look out to for labor? They are going to start looking to African countries as usual and yeah. Eastern European countries because of because they like free, uh, free, uh, uh, cheap labor. So yeah. they are going to be coming online and offering mouth-watering. Uh, um, offer so we are going to really have to be very aggressive and warn the, warning them that look this mindset of yours that going abroad is better than nigeria you've got to be careful because you are just going to be enslaved 
All right. Thank you so much, Dame Julie. Thank you so much because that's quite encouraging to find out that the agency is trying its best to eradicate or at least to curb this um, crime of human trafficking and what is doing to support the uh, vulnerable victims at the moment. Now, my next guest um, is someone based in the UK here. She is actually the founder and the CEO of Africa, Africans Unite Against Child Abuse. She founded uh, the agency uh, many years ago and she's been on several, uh, several fora to discuss and enlighten us about child abuse. The person I want to introduce right now is no other than Debbie Ario OBE. Debbie, welcome to RAM. Hello, Debbie, can you hear me? Debbie Ario. Hello, Debbie. Debbie, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Debbie. Welcome to uh, okay, that's good. Brand, I think, the African uh, Mindset once uh, again. Yes, um, I know that you, you have this platform for improving diaspora engagement in anti-trafficking and anti-slavery work. Would you say your definition of human trafficking is different from what Dame Julie has said? Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this forum. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, uh, there's been uh, a lot of uh, discussion here in the UK in relation to uh, whether the term human trafficking actually captures the entirety of the experiences that victims go through. And wow. so some uh, academics and activists like myself uh, 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 prefer the usage of the term modern slavery. And in fact, that's part and parcel of the uh, of what informed the Modern Slavery Act of 2015 here in the UK. Mm -hmm. So what, what exactly do we mean by uh, modern slavery? So some of these experts who have come up with this term uh, are basing uh, this idea around uh, the 1926 Convention mm -hmm. to suppress the slave trade and slavery. And the whole point of that, uh, of that convention is really about uh, the control of a human being by another human being, such as a, as, as a person might control a thing. So really, that the, that the, um, the Palermo Protocol, which defines human trafficking, that, that definition does not actually capture the whole scope of what uh, victims go through, i.e. that control by a human being of one other person just like you will control a thing. So that's where the notion of uh, modern slavery uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. And to be sincere, I do subscribe to this personally and professionally, just simply because of my uh, experience of working with so many uh, victims from, mainly from Nigeria, obviously, but from mm -hmm. other African countries here in the UK, because it is not just about the abuse, it is not just about the exploitation, some of the experiences that these people have gone through, no matter the amount of therapy we give them, no matter how much we support them, many of them will never forget these experiences, these experiences which is tantamount to being enslaved by another human being. So that's where, I guess, the, the, this notion of modern slavery comes from. And as far as I'm concerned, I think uh, it's justified. I know a lot of people are against it. They think it's too far-fetched that we're trying to compare it to, to the slavery of, of old. But, but, then, but that's where the, the term modern comes in. So we're looking at slavery in its modern form, i.e. Uh, the control of one person by another person, such as we might, uh, what that person might con control a thing. So I guess, I don't, I don't know if that, that definition or that explanation is clear. So if, if, if I could just recap what you've said, modern day slavery is more or less the same thing as human trafficking? No, it's, it's, going, it's, going, it's going a step further. It's going a step further and looking at control. Right. So the current definition, the, the definition of human trafficking does not talk about control. 
it talks about abuse. Right. It talks about exploitation. It talks about the movement of people. Right. It doesn't talk about how one human being controls the entirety of another human being's life mm -hmm. and basically enslaving them. So that's, so that's where the difference comes in. Okay, thank you. Um, we've seen um, you on TV several times talking about children being enslaved and um, in the United Kingdom here. So do you just focus on children or do you focus on individuals as well? And as you know, just to ask that question as well, is that do you engage with other agencies back home in Nigeria or um, in other African countries? Well, thank you very much. That's a very uh, good question. We work with children and young people. Right. Uh, most of the young people that we work with were actually trafficked when they were children. So they are basically uh, historic victims of trafficking. And just simply because of their experiences as children, also crossing over into adulthood in many cases, Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we support them. So in fact, they, they form the bulk of the young people that we supported at Africa. Right. And we work, uh, we work uh, uh, with partners in different countries. We work, uh, for example, uh, with, with NAPTIP and Dimjuli. Uh, we also obviously uh, attest to that. We signed uh, an MOU with NAPTIP in uh, 2018 mm -hmm. to collaborate in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other countries in Africa where we have uh, partners like Syria, Leon, and Kenya. Uh, we want to strengthen, obviously, those relationships. But as it is now, the bulk of our work is UK-focused. And it's simply it's UK-focused for the simple reason that there's so many uh, issues to address here uh, in the UK. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Debbie Ariyo. Our next speaker is... Uh, the chairman and the chief executive officer of the Nigerian Sin Diaspora uh, Commission, otherwise known as NIDCOM. She's the pioneer chair house, uh, chairman house committee on diaspora affairs. Uh, the person I'm talking about is no other than Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa. Welcome to Renewing African Mindset discussion this afternoon, uh, Honorable Abike. Could you tell us a bit more about your organization, NIDCOM, and how it supports the Nigerian diaspora? Well, the Nigerian Diaspora Commission is a new creation of government and uh, will be one year old in a couple of months, passed by law. And um, uh, the aim of the Diaspora Commission is to mobilize the Nigerians in the diaspora because we know that all over the world we have Nigerians in the diaspora, including you. Hmm who are doing enormous things all over the world. So how do we harness these resources for the glory development of the motherland? Take this COVID-19 period, for instance. It's obvious that home will always be home. There'll be a time you have to come back home. Now, which home are you going to? So we're not saying pack your bags and come home. We're saying, wherever you are, let's work with you. Let's work with the motherland. We want you to be involved in the programs and policies of government. So in that regard, we work with Nigerians all over the continent. There are various diaspora organizations. We have the Nigeria Diaspora Organization, which is uh, a big umbrella organization set up by then President Olusegun Obasanjo. We have several organizations and individuals that we work with. So the idea is let's work together. Now, since the um, creation of the commission, we've had a few programs. There's the annual diaspora day, July 25th, July um, 25th every year. This year, I don't think it's going to hold. Maybe we're going to do a webinar or something where Nigerians and diaspora come together to celebrate ourselves and talk about development and progress of the country. We've had the Nigerian Diaspora Investments Summit. We've, we've had three. The fourth one should be November this year, where we have Nigerians in the diaspora. This um, 2019, almost about 300 Nigerians in the diaspora came home with their businesses to see where they can invest. And we're so happy that we have them investing in agriculture, mm -hmm. healthcare, education, and uh, the food business. Those are the areas of interest. And we've done a survey to Nigeria in the diaspora asking, really, would you want to invest in your country? 96% of them said, yes, they want to invest. And their challenge is, yes. So we work with Nigerian um, Investment Promotion Council, the ease of doing business office and all that, to see how we can 
look at these challenges and I call it Nigeria's in the diaspora to invest at home. So we have a lot of programs and activities to we're working with the World Bank and the Ministry of Labor, for instance, on the issue of managed migration. Right. Now you have a lot of Nigerians, I mean, you don't need to travel abroad to get yourself into trouble. If we are sincere with COVID-19 coming, and I heard um, DJ Napti talking about that. Listen, if you want to go somewhere, you need your labor, let's do it properly. The way the Philippines do it. In the Philippines, they had over $6 billion for managed migration. So we're working in that regard with some organizations, and I hope that we can pull that through, and several others. But the key thing is, wherever you are as a Nigerian, how can we work with you? What can we do with you? How can we work together? But the key thing, again, is data. That's Without right. data, you can't do anything. Just like the issue of data is cropping up now with COVID-19. So when the process of gathering data of Nigeria in the diaspora, what are they doing? Where are you? What are you doing? So that at any point in time, we can click a button and say, well, we have uh, Fumi there who is into this and that. So data is key. We're working, we're working on data. And a few other programs and activities aimed at the diaspora and ensuring that we work with our diaspora brothers and sisters. And you know what? We can't ignore the power of the diaspora. That's right. Last year alone, over $26 billion remitted into the Nigerian economy. Definitely, this will be affected this year because of COVID-19. So we, we have to look into that and what to do. But the key thing is not just in the diaspora want to invest at home. They will invest at home. And we continue to work at that. Okay. Thank you so much for such uh, comprehensive information or, uh, regarding NITCOM. It's funny you should mention uh, the database. Each time when I do have uh, discussions with different uh, judges of various agencies, they always come up with the same thing, or oh, is the database. Do we have to try as much as possible to create awareness about the importance of having database? I think it is. What do you think? Honorable I don't think... I don't think it's about awareness. We all know the importance of database. Well, for Nigeria, and I, NIMSI, the organization, the National Identity Management Commission, he's on you know, a database uh, drive. And we're working with NIMSI to work on database of Nigerians in the diaspora. We're also working with groups and associations. I think at this point in time, we should know the awareness about the government agencies making sure that this is done. So, and then there are many ways to go about it. You have the BV and you have the, you have many things. So I think NIMSI is working at, the database seriously in Nigeria. So we all know the importance of database and it's nothing that should be ignored, actually. Don't you think it's something to do with the mindset then? Because I could recall just before COVID-19, um, you know, when everybody was trying to uh, take it serious, some people actually traveled back home. And as usual, when they're asked, you know, uh, to complete the, um, car, uh, the card when they're on board the flight, uh, complete your uh, uh, the card, you give us your name, address, contact number. A lot of people don't do that. Do you think it's something to do with the mindset? Why do they want to know my name? I could recall a friend of mine said, a few days after COVID-19 became a big issue in Nigeria, they actually went to his house. They, you know, from the card, you placed him there to test him. So do you think it's something to do with our mindset? There are many things to do with our mindset that we have to change <laughs> as a people. For instance, if we're trying to get data of Nigerians in the diaspora, they don't want you to know their names. So yeah. what we do is, look, for every mission abroad, yes. get a data of the Nigerians. If it's 10, then we work with 10. Mm -hmm. Take our students, for instance. We keep saying, when you go abroad, go to the missions in those countries so that they can know you're there. Mm -hmm. Know that when there's, a when there's a problem, then you now say, oh, there's a problem. Take Wuhan, for instance, in China, mm -hmm. where this incident uh, broke down. We have about 60 students in Wuhan, there yeah. are about, but the beauty about them is they had a database, they had their numbers, they had an association. Yeah. So when, they, when this problem broke out, it was difficult to work with them. So when they came to us and said, we need help, yeah. how many are you? They had the data, they gave us the names right. of all the students in Wuhan. So it was easy to convince Mr. President to say, okay, these are the number of students we have there, let's give them this financial support. And you know what they did? They didn't lie. I love those students. They didn't lie. They didn't capitalize on the situation. They said $500 per student is all we need. China is doing everything we need to, to have, but a little change in our pockets. And they got it. Imagine there was no data. Now, some people try to lie. You say, oh, we're in Wuhan. But they were not, because they were not on the data. Mm -hmm. If you were and, they, and you didn't register, then you have a problem. So maybe that's an example to tell our people, particularly the younger ones. When you go to institutions abroad, courses, let the missions know. It's a different thing if you say, we went there, they didn't attend to us, but at least go there. 
Maybe. So I think I agree with you, mindset, because even in the, in the, in the survey we did, mm -hmm. a lot of people, we just said, don't tell us your name. We just want to know, what do you need? What do you do? Are you, what's your profession? What's your qualification? What's your age? Mm -hmm. We knew when we put name and everything, we made it optional or not even necessary. But um, as we move on, I believe that it's about the trust element. You're right. Why are you asking for my name? Can I trust you? So as we build trust, one amongst ourselves, and between government and the people, I think it will get better. When you know that if I know your name, yes. at the time of trouble, I can get you and help you out. Mm -hmm. So maybe think the way you believe, I think it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's about trust efficiency, which we all need to work on. That's right. I have just a question for you. During this COVID-19, how is it impacting on efforts to repatriate uh, migrants from detention centers in countries like Libya? Well, two things happening now. Number one, there's the effort to bring back home stranded Nigerians abroad. I think that's the number one problem now. There yes. are over 2,000, I think I look at 3,000 Nigerians in about 75 countries right. who traveled for one reason or the other. Now, these are not Nigerians living in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. These are Nigerians who traveled maybe for medicals, vacation, courses, programs, and they got caught in the uh, COVID-19 closure of the airport. So they want to come back. There's a lady in the US, went to, she went to have a baby mm -hmm. and she's stranded. There's a, there's a lady whose husband just passed on. She's stranded somewhere abroad. So it's important that they come back home. But again, in these circumstances, mm -hmm. how do you come back home? Mm -hmm. Do you want to come back? And then um, the situation we're in now, are we going to make it worse or better? So there will be protocols mm -hmm. to ensure you know, they, 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 they fulfill before coming up. But that, that, however, is in the purview of the other Minister of Foreign Affairs who is in the presidential task force. So that is one major problem that needs to be dealt with. Okay. Now, secondly, is um, the issue of prisoners in various countries. Mm -hmm. We, in, in many countries, the missions have appealed to the co governments of those countries to give amnesty to some of those prisoners, depending mm -hmm. on their offenses. Like President Buhari, here in Nigeria has given amnesty to prisoners. Like in Tanzania, there was a um, report in papers about how they wanted amnesty. But the thing is, in Tanzania, the mission had actually been able to get reparation for about 60 out of 73 prisoners. So the ambassador was here in Nigeria in January. He's been able to secure repatriation for them, and then the COVID-19 thing happened. And then the question is, who pays? Nigeria, the country, how do you sort it out? So that is there. So as much as they say we are prisoners, we want to get out, it's left to the country of uh, where you are to give you that clemency, as President Buhari has done. So various missions are working on them, and we hope it, it works out fine. So those are uh, two of the areas. And then again, we appeal to Nigerians, wherever you are, please be good ambassadors of your country. Mm -hmm. for, for instance, in Tanzania, mm -hmm. while the mission got reprieve for 60 prisoners out of 73, Right in the middle of that, a Nigerian was coming back to Nigeria and he was caught with Indian hemp. So wow. it actually takes away all the effort. What are you bringing Indian hemp from there to Nigeria for now? He's, got, he's been detained. He has to go to the high court. There's no amount of begging you beg for that. So we also always appeal to Nigeria, just be good ambassadors of your country, wherever you are, because it's more difficult when you have to be begging for an offense you committed. However, if you did not commit the crime, trust us will be there to stand by you and ensure you get justice. Okay, thank you very much. If I bring the focus back to human trafficking, when these people are repatriated, which agencies actually take over? And are they quarantined when they go back in there? Are they quarantined? Which people? After Nigeria. What happens after? Which people now? Where, I mean, the focus is on human uh, people, the victims of human trafficking. If you now get them back into Nigeria, which agencies take over? And are they part no, no. of human trafficking? Human yeah. trafficking is strictly NAPTIP business. So even when you come back, you're handed over to NAPTIP. Okay. Because what we do, really, we don't get involved in human trafficking per se. But here's the thing. Yeah. For instance, in Lebanon, <laughs> there's a distress call. This young yeah. girl in trouble, you want her back. We liaise with the mission to see what we can do in terms of consular services and provision. So right. when the girl is released, she's handed over to NAPTI. Because right. you see, it goes beyond her coming back. Who trafficked you? How did you get there? What is being done? So it's NAPTI that deals with all that. NAPTI has to ensure traffickers are prosecuted. They should be named, shamed, and jailed. As long as traffickers are walking about, trafficking will not stop. So the key thing is, it's okay you're back, but NAPTI needs to investigate. NAPTI needs to know what happened, 
who trafficked you. NAPTIP also needs to do a lot of um, security checks and profiling and all that. So definitely it goes back to NAPTIP because it goes beyond just, if you're not a victim of trafficking, maybe um, you just went, you overstayed your visa. Like there's a guy we brought back from Kenya not too long ago. He overstayed his visa, he was locked up. He wasn't trafficked. He went himself, overstayed his visa, he's back home. And we've been able to set him up in his own business. He's walking out and saying, you know what? It's not worth it. So for trafficking, definitely, we hand them over to NAPTIP. <laughs> okay. Just hang in there because I still have one more question for you. Let me throw it back to Dame Julie. Dame Julie, say, for example, Honorable Abike uh, uh, and her team, they've been successful in repatriating this uh, victims of human trafficking. When you take over, say, for example, during the season of COVID-19, what, I mean, what do you do with this victim? Well, once the victim is repatriated, yes. we take the victim into our custody. Right. Uh, do proper profiling of the victim. We we'll find out how they got to wherever they went to, who was responsible for their trip and all of that. Yes. And um, whilst we start the counseling session with the victim, because we, had, we have trained counselors at the shelters. Mm -hmm. So the victims are taken straight away to the shelters and we start the psychosocial support for the victims. Whilst doing that, our investigators get straight to work. They start working on the um, agents who were responsible for taking them there. Mm -hmm. We go after them, arrest them, and of course we prosecute them. Then we rehabilitate the victims. We've had so many victims like that that came back from uh, Libya and other countries like mm -hmm. that. We rehabilitated them, they went through university, they graduated, mm -hmm. and we now employed them in nothing. So yeah, those, that's for those who want to work you know, for those who want to do some form of trade, we also encourage them to do some training of that. So we ensure that they are better off, you know, when they leave than when they came. Okay. So, I mean, during this uh, uh, crisis of COVID-19, did you ever have people coming back repatriated to Nigeria at all? No, 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 no. We didn't because, I mean, there was a lockdown in most of the countries. But the truth now is that... Um, uh, Mr. President is making arrangements through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to right. bring down those that are stranded in Nigeria, mm -hmm. I mean, stranded in the rest of the world in batches of 200. Yeah. But I believe that in these batches of 200 that will be coming any, anytime soon, right. we will definitely have victims of trafficking. They are always there. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to sieve out, profile them, sieve out the victims of trafficking, we take them to the shelter and then we deal with only victims of trafficking, not just uh, irregular migrants yeah, or you, people migrants who are stranded. Yeah, what I'm trying to get at is during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, do you ensure that they are tested? Because oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. We're not going to put anybody in my shelter without testing them. So definitely when they come back, they are going to be tested. They all will be tested first. And then they'll be quarantined. And in the period of the quarantine, of course, they'll be tested. And then we'll know those that are, are okay. And then we'll take them to the shelter. Okay. That's, that's very important to know because oh. if not, if they're just taken to shelters, then of course they, they, the cases will just be rising for um, people okay. who are testing positive all the time for COVID-19. Um, I'm going to throw this question back to um, Honorable Abiker again. There have been questions, uh, you know, people talking about NIDCOM, that um, how come NIDCOM does not set up centers in different countries across the world you know, like because they know they have local knowledge that if you were to create uh, little centers or cell groups of um, individuals who will be more than willing to work you know voluntarily that instead of you you know doing everything by yourself because it's a cumbersome task going to and fro all the time that why don't you use those cell groups and at the end of the day they feed you with the information from different countries but that's exactly what we do that's exactly what we do don't forget that we're, we're still a new agency we're not a year old there yet we don't even have an office as i spoke with you here in nigeria we're trying to set up so that's what we do don't forget that we have diaspora organizations all over we have diaspora groups, diaspora organizations all over. And with technology, you really don't have to be everywhere except where you need to be. So that's exactly what we're doing. And we're, 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 it's taking shape. And we want to have, subsequently we want to have offices in um, strategic parts of the world, but that needs funding. Like we have in New York, 
we want to have a place in London. But the key thing is we're working with Nigerians there. For instance, in the UK, we have a group of Nigerian leaders that we just leave everything to them and then they feed us back with the information. We also have in the US, we have in Africa, and then, like I said, we have these diaspora associations. And there, a lot of them are on various WhatsApp platforms that we are also part of. We have the youth groups, we have the students, we have the associations. So we are building that and we continue to do that. And you talked about volunteerism. So it's so um, amazing the number of Nigerians who are volunteering say, we'll do this for you here, we'll do this for you there. So we're building the data and we're working with that. And even as we speak for COVID-19, we have a group of Nigerians in the diaspora that have come together to raise funds mm -hmm. to help out in the country. And uh, we've raised a reasonable amount of funds, but they are still at it. And so it's very impressive that despite the challenges they are facing, some of them have, have had cuts in their salaries, but they are there putting some money together to give back to the country to help people, particularly on the front line. And even during this COVID-19, we're having a data of Nigerians on the front line. We've lost about 26 Nigerians some of them on the front line, some prominent Nigerians have lost their lives. We're reaching out to them, we're saying what we can do with them, we're going to celebrate them as heroes of COVID-19. So yes, absolutely we're doing that and we're reaching you, you're going to be one of our cell groups too. <laughs> uh, for your information, I, I was actually a member of the Board of Trustees for Nigerians in Diaspora Organization. Okay. When, uh, okay. <laughs> who was the president when, uh, when General Obasanjo actually uh, inaugurated uh, NIDO. That was it. Yeah. yeah. You have Genet Bandi now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce to us is uh, a director in the Directorate for Public Prosecutions for Lagos State, Dr. Jude Martins. Is of course a lawyer. I'm going to ask you a question regarding your agency. Can you just give us under one minute an overview of your agency? Yes, um, thank you for the invitation. The Directorate of Public Prosecution is a department within the Ministry of Justice, and we are charged with the responsibility for prosecuting different offenses, mm -hmm. more especially in consonance with the Governor Babajide Sonwolu's team. Within the five point agenda, the, His Excellency is focusing on security and governance. So for offenses that involve trafficking of human beings beyond Nigeria, or even exploitations of human beings in Nigeria, we are responsible for um, pro uh, prosecuting offenders. More importantly, because like earlier indicated by Dame Julie, the main legislation for trafficking in person is a federal legislation, but we have an attorney general of the federation fiat to prosecute those offenses in Lagos state courts as well. So we can do that. But more importantly, I just want to emphasize that um, trafficking in person is an abuse of human rights. And the emergence of trafficking in person prohibition law enforcement and administration act 2003 as amended is the government response to ensuring that victims of trafficking are rescued and rehabilitated and the perpetrators are prosecuted. So we as a prosecuting agency will focus on some offenses that are usually relating to trafficking in persons. Mm -hmm. Offenses like child abduction, defilement, forgery, obtaining document by false pretenses, obtaining public document by false pretenses. These are preparatory offenses that are often committed by perpetrators of trafficking in person. So we as a government agency, we focus so much on trying to stop the stem mm -hmm. of trafficking offenses from the outset. Because once you know that somebody is trying to obtain a birth certificate or a passport fraudulently, which he or she is not entitled to, it's more likely that such public do document will be used to perpetrate further offenses, particularly trafficking in person. So that's why it's very, very incumbent on us mm -hmm. to ensure that we are very tough in prosecuting these preparatory offenses. And we've been able to also respond more specifically 
to the issue of domestic violence and sexual offenses. In Lagos State, we have the Domestic Violence and Sexual Offenses Response Team, which is a multilateral, uh, multi-party multi multi approach mm -hmm. to dealing with the issue of domestic violence and sexual offenses, which are usually preparatory offenses, like them, Julie has mentioned, before people get trafficked. When you get um, an underage being brought to Lagos to stay with a relative, with the hope that Lagos will be used as a transit state for taking them abroad, then we want to look into that kind of arrangement to make sure that the victim is not being exploited. And it's very, very important for us as a state because obviously apart from being an abuse of human rights, which the government has the obligation to, to protect, it is also seen as economic crime because people who are organized crime, who are involved in this type of offenses, often derive a lot of financial and economic and pecuniary advantage. And these are the incentives that often keep them in business. So we as a government often try as much as possible to strengthen out these acquisitive tendencies or these benefits that are often involved in this type of offenses. So that's why we also, at times, some of the victims are kidnapped. So in our law in Lagos State, under the anti-kidnapping law 2017, so if somebody allow his house to be used for kidnapping or, or, or keeping of a kidnapped person, under section law, section 11 of that law, the person will be, if convicted, will be sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. Also under section 15 of that law, that particular house can be forfeited to the state. So these are things that the state government are doing to strengthen out, to, to, to sort of get rid of the advantage of people who are involved in this, in this kind of um, offenses because it's, it's pecuniary. It's because they have money. Most of the times, people who are involved in this are also involved in drug dealing. At times, some of the traffic person, they will use them as drug mole in taking drugs abroad. And I'm sure Dale Julie can, can, can also confirm that. So, so, so the exploitation starts from here and it's double whammy for their double jeopardy. Apart from being trafficked, they are also being used as drug mole. So when they are on the other side, they will be arrested as a traffic person and also as a person who, has, who, has, uh, who is carrying drugs. So, so some of the recommendations which I would mention is that we need to engage more with the victims because they are victims of circumstances beyond their control, often because of economic disability or haven't come from less where to do background. Most of them often go for this juicy offer, which is often not genuine. It is crime that is, you know, that, that, that is planned and revolved around the greed of some individuals, even at times family relatives. Mm -hmm. Family relatives are also involved in this perpetration of trafficking. So what, what, what is important for us to also have a, a good working relationship with international organization. And I know that Interpol does a lot of work with NAPTIV and also with, with, with the state government in dealing with such offenses because they are transborder, isn't it? Most of the times, the offenses will be committed. Some element of the offenses will be committed in Lagos. And how our law is so robust mm -hmm. so that even when you are involved and you are not caught here, if you are repatriated under the trafficking in person prohibition law, you can still be prosecuted in Nigeria, which is, which is a very, very, um, a very, very innovative part of the law. And because there is need to make sure that these people don't go score free. I think the other thing we also need to do is to be able to work effectively with the informants who are able to give valuable information about people that are involved in this type of crime. We need to set up a very robust scheme that will protect the identity because if the identity is not protected, they will run risk of being or coming to some harm by this organized group. I think those are the few things that I want to mention now yeah. for, 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 
for the moment. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, in fact, you mentioned this agency, Domestic um, uh, Sexual Domestic Violence, violence and Sexual Response yeah, we Team. Had, we had a couple of our representatives last week when we um, had uh, a discussion on domestic violence. Yes, I could actually vouch to that. Uh, it's actually a good agency and um, hopefully other agencies would uh, ensure that um, they live up to expectations of why they've been established. One thing I just wanted to say is that we keep on talking about human trafficking uh, from an international perspective. Yes. However, um, I think it's also interstate, and this is where I'm going to bring in uh, Carrie Pemberton Ford to just shed a bit of more light on human trafficking, because once we hear human trafficking, it's always from an international perspective. Um, Reverend Carrie Pemberton Ford, she's, an, uh, she's actually uh, an executive director at Cambridge Center of Applied uh, research into human trafficking. She has been working in the field of domestic abuse, coercive control, uh, gender-based violence, and um, challenge of culturally abusive scenarios. Uh, welcome to uh, RAM program, uh, Thank you, Reverend Anne. Carrie Pemberton. Lovely to be here. Can you shed more light regarding uh, human trafficking because all I'm hearing is just international, but we do hear about it within interstate as well, or within African countries. Well, indeed, um, and the UNODC, which is in, in charge really of looking after the Palermo Protocol and, and the way it's been distributed across uh, over 117 countries signed into the Palermo Protocol and absorbed into their um, legal frameworks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is the basis for most, uh, most enforcement agencies and protection agencies to be working around, and that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, but you know the Palermo Protocol, if you if you like, uh, strips down to three principles. It's an action, it's a means, and it's a purpose. And these actions are recruitment. The means can be coercion, can be deception. Uh, it's basically the thorough abuse of power on uh, another's life. And the purpose, of course, is exploitation. Make as much as you can yeah. of that person who's been recruited into a into a criminal um, framework. Now, the point is that, you know, exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, the business opportunity can take place domestically, can take place between countries within a particular um, continent. So that's why in Africa you have quite a, 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 a lot of uh, trafficking going on between countries as well as within Nigeria itself. And then, of course, you have the interregional uh, trafficking that goes across not just from Nigeria across to the UK or Italy or Spain, but actually across into um, the Middle East um, uh, and, and uh, down uh, from, um, from Nigeria to South Africa and, uh, and across indeed um, some of them to go to other arenas. Now, domestic trafficking, that can be exploitation, child exploitation. Um, uh, it's frequently um, labor exploitation with domestic servitude as well. So domestic servitude tends to capture more females than males, but males can be get embroiled in that. You can have fostering, um, you can have adoption trafficking. Um, of course, in Africa, you also have um, child uh, absorption into armies and of course, concubinage. I mean, the thing, uh, the, the forms of exploitation are multiple, multiple, multiple. Uh, and I um, mean, we have on our CART website um, some illustrations of how um, varied that can become. I mean, in Britain, it's interesting because it, originally when the national referral mechanism was set up to try and track what was going on in the UK, originally the sorts of barrier about 2,000 people when I started in, in camp trafficking work uh, back in two, um, 2003, uh, that was the number, but um, we, we, we went and um, suggested that it might be as high as 20,000, 10 to 20,000 here in the UK. And of course now, now the child sex station has started put into domestic trafficking legislation. So, uh, because of the way we 
rings, the exploitations work, we're easily into that sort of territory. And I, well, it, it's not going to be a surprise that in Nigeria, the numbers are going to grow and grow. But, you know, I think, Anne, um, and uh, Julie, it's great to have you here and, and all the other uh, experts around this panel. Thank you uh, for allowing me to come and, and, and engage with you on this. I think COVID-19 presents us with two very interesting things. One is it does show us, it shows governments across the world how different our ability to test and to uh, describe and to be aware of what is happening with COVID. So our numbers are very, very different right across the world. And it doesn't actually tell the same story because it's a different sort of testing that's going on. Um, and the same with trafficking. Trafficking is like COVID. Yeah. Trafficking is like COVID. It's hidden. Mm. You go out and you can't see it. The only when you've got the right testing mechanism or when people get very ill and need to be brought into hospital, do you see it? Otherwise, it's under the radar. We cannot see it. And that's absolutely identical to how trafficking is. And that makes it very difficult, just as COVID is difficult for governments to get a grip on. That makes trafficking actually quite difficult, challenging for governments across the world to, to address. And secondly, it makes it uh, difficult for people to understand quite what sort of challenge it is. Mm -hmm. Am I seeing trafficking? Mm -hmm. um, Debbie might put it in, am I seeing modern day slavery? The two are slightly distinct actually in terms of the law, but you know, hey, it, these are umbrella terms mm -hmm. for which the general population can say, well, actually, you know, okay, so coronaviruses are a little bit different, but they're all corona and they're very damaging and some are more lethal than others. And corona-19 is really problematic. And I think that, you know, actually this awful experience that we're going through, mm -hmm does help us to understand a bit as to how challenging trafficking is to actually get a grip on and, and the importance, mm -hmm. as it will be with COVID-19, yeah. of a united approach to it, a really united approach to it. Because if there isn't a thoroughly united approach to this across nations mm -hmm. to the COVID challenge, you would just have reinfection going on, reinfection, reinfection, and the same goes with human trafficking. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, how do you think the aftercare of human trafficking victims should be managed with focus on the mental and the, emo uh, the um, emotional aspects? Oh, well, this is absolutely critical. I mean, we started off our work um, when I set up the Church's Alert to Sex Trafficking across Europe and then worked with Operations Pentameter. We absolutely privileged the... Um, the care of the victims. And in fact, they couldn't start their police work until we've got some safe houses to expand the work of the fabulous Poppy project that was in place. And that unfortunately, um, you know, lost its government funding. So uh, went into a demise cycle, but putting, putting the safety yes. and then the psychological recovery and understanding the psychological space, the trauma, uh, the fear, the anxiety, the disturbance that has happened to victims of trafficking has to be understood by all the uh, enforcement and uh, justice systems. Absolutely, it's critical because otherwise you cannot get uh, the next step of getting the proper accounts of what's been happening into the prosecution um, uh, sector. That's really incredibly important. But absolutely central is the welfare of the person themselves, whether they are an adult male or female, child, you know, you've got to understand, as Debbie said, this, the tr multiple traumas, multiple traumas that a trafficking victim has been through embeds not just in the flesh. Sometimes there are no marks. They, there can be no marks on a trafficking victim. But the, inside, the, uh, inside the mind, the memory and what people have been, been through around yeah. coercion, that is the problem and and uh, there's been some very recent excellent work across europe with psychologists working together to map that and and uh, you know i look forward to working with the nigerian authorities on this because they've got some fantastic psychologists at work in in uh, in nigeria and it would be wonderful to just harmonize some of the work that's come out of spain and the uk with nigeria 
but it takes resource and yeah. all of this takes resource like covid covid mm -hmm. is going to take immense resource mm -hmm. trillions of pounds worth of resource yeah. to sort it out and we have to ha we we have to have the same sort of mindset if you like yeah about how destructive not just for the individual because it is mm -hmm. who gets victimized actually how destructive it is for the whole of a, the society right to have trafficking in amongst us i don't think we've quite got there i don't think we've got that narrative as to the destructive power of having human trafficking as part of the mix of our societies it's it um, and we, we will be looking at that in our symposium in june so watch this space because we'll be giving that sort of narrative back yeah. i hope it lifts our performance mm -hmm. would you say um given the current climate um that um whistleblowing should be going on because how else would you know what's going on behind closed doors uh carrie so just give me the top end of that question again Anne. okay would you say that uh, we should uh, more or less create a culture of whistleblowing on this oh. uh, this uh, human trafficking yeah. okay so it is bad in itself now we have covid 19 and people are suffering behind yes. those doors and yes. more compounded so is it a case of trying to be a whistleblower well, I mean, I wouldn't put it as whistleblowing because whistleblowing tends to happen, although there, there is elements of that but in, in uh, organisations, right? But, yeah. you know, if you, it, I think it's about properly taking care of our neighbour, yeah. <laughs> properly okay. being aware of yeah. what is going on. So yeah. in terms of places where the, where the exploitation is occurring, you know, everybody is set in neighbourhoods, in communities, in faith communities, there are people looking all the time now if you saw somebody with a persistent cough and looking as though they're running a temperature you wouldn't nowadays you wouldn't just go oh well you know that's all right no 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 you'd be thinking hey hey that person probably needs the intervention of some sort of um mm. health provider to protect them and to protect us and it's that sort of mindset that i think needs to shift mm. that we don't just think oh trafficking oh well, yes you know well hey okay so there, 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 there's people living 10 to a house or 15 to a house or in that house there's some a cluster of young females mm -hmm. and there's men coming in there and night but you know actually it's not bothering me and I don't want to interfere mm -hmm. it, actually it's about stepping up and going we are each other's keeper we are each other's neighbor what damages them actually will in the end damage me and that's the shift i think in mindset we're getting around covid yes and we need to get that shift in mindset about how we take care mm -hmm. of each other's space and welfare and if we did that then the, the these these areas where in trafficking for instance ghana ghana nigeria mm -hmm. has a cluster of say of of uh, labor exploitation for children that has been historic mm -hmm. you know and, and it's, there's still a challenge with it. Well, you know, those people who are seeing that or the, the recruitment of young women for their gametes or for surrogacy, you know, which is not properly managed or child marriage, etc. Mm -hmm. Actually, to, to teach all our communities, you've learned now about COVID, mm -hmm. how to be protective of the whole community. Yeah. Trafficking is like this. Trafficking is like this. And I think that could be a real step change, Anne. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Karen Pemberton. Ford, I have a question for Honorable Abike here. Uh, maybe we should just open the floor for question and answers, please. If you do have any question, you can use the emoticon on your uh, device there to either to signify by raising up your hand or, or to actually type it in the uh, chat box. Uh, the question is, how do we change people's mindset? One of the main issues is authority. People don't feel safe releasing their information. Corruption, or what will the data, or what will the data be used for? So, how do we change the mindset regarding that? That's why I said there's a trust deficit. We need yeah. to build trust between government and the people. Yeah. You know, so if you know that that data is for a productive purpose, for instance, you know that that data, if government had it, they can reach you in terms of COVID nineteen. Right. You can put it, but then, so, but because, oh, what do they want to do with me? Why do they want my name? What is it, yeah. the problem? So I agree with you, the mindset has to change, but then there has to be 
more trust between government and the people. If you know that with that data, yeah. uh, when government, you know, wants to give something to your children, oh, we have your data, we can even call on you. So, yeah. and, you know, so I think I agree with you, we have to change the mindset, but we have to work on building more trust between government and the people. And like we are beginning to build in the diaspora, seeing that the commission is on board and seeing that we're beginning to do things, it's not a problem saying, okay, let's be able to reach. It's a gradual thing, but we're beginning to get there. If you're in a country illegally, you're there illegally. Of course, you don't want to give your data. So we know that is there. But a diaspora is actually somebody who, who has a home, an address, a job in the country of destination. Yeah. You know? So you have the contact, you're paying tax. That's yeah. the legal definition of a diaspora. But for the irregular migrants, you get into trouble, we're always there for you. So trust deficit, and we need to work on that. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, does anybody, I think I have another question here. Um, The person actually said the platform for holding the data must be registered with a uh, credible regulatory commission. I guess th th that's what uh, this person is trying to say. I think it's just a comment. Like Nido, when the person said, like Nido, when the database was launched. So obviously, it has to be regulated or else, uh, because uh, there's always this trust issue, just like what you said um, about us. We don't, we, we tend not to trust each other. So it's like, what do they need my details for? So this person is just making a comment just to support what you've just said, Honorable Abike, by saying that, yeah. like Nido, it has to be regulatory, credible regulatory information. Like NITCOM. Oh, yeah. Like, like NITCOM, you don't have NITCOM, so it's easy for them to say, okay, we know you have an agency. We can work with you. I think that's it. Okay. Um, is there any more question uh, on here? I'm trying to look at my chat here, and I'm also trying to look at the Facebook. Are there any more questions? Um, any more questions? If there aren't any more questions, uh, what I would just say is that, to be quite honest, this has been a very engaging um, discussion here today. Uh, I've learned so much more about NITCOM. I've learned about NAPTIP. I can remember when I was talking with, uh, okay, some people have raised up their hands. But, okay, let me just quickly take a couple of questions here. Can you please comment on what domestic violence victims in response to COVID-19 is? Um, can you please comment? We did that last week. I don't want to go back on that. We, today, we're just focusing on human trafficking. Uh, then somebody asked the question, what authority should one report trafficking to? Um, I, I think I'll throw the question to Dame Julie. Dame Julie, are you still with us or one of our representatives? I'm with you. I'm okay, in. somebody said, what authority should we first report trafficking to? What authority? Nap, nap, nap tip. Okay. Except you don't have a nap tip in the state, and then you can report to the police, and the police will always um, um, refer to nap tip, hopefully. Okay. All you right. know, the problems we have sometimes is that when um, cases of trafficking are reported to the police, um, it's very difficult for them to refer to native and they'll tell you, oh, they are going to handle it and all of that. At the end of the day, the cases just um, get lost. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for Debbie Ario. What's your question, please, Debbie? Actually, I just, uh, can you hear me? I just wanted to uh, uh, say something in relation to what uh, the Honorable Minister uh, Abike Dabri said in relation to you know, when you're, when you're as a diaspora, and so I'm talking as a diaspora now, this is not really about trafficking. It's an important subject matter in relation to COVID. When people are going back home on, on the flight, and then you have to fill those forms in, I'm always very, very reluctant to put down my, my details because, well, for security reasons. Mm -hmm. And most people will tell you that's the reason why they would never put down the uh, details on, on the form for the simple reason that they don't want uh, they don't want to find themselves in a, in a security uh, issue. I, they, don't, they, they don't know where those forms will end up. They don't know who have access to those forms. They don't know how secured their data, which is what they've written on the form. They don't know how secure that data is. And so if there's any way people can be reassured in relation to the security of their data, then I guess more people will feel a lot more relaxed about, you know, 
uh, parting with their data, you know, uh, especially in relation to safeguarding uh, during uh, COVID-19. Okay. I think uh, Honorable Abike has actually just answered that. Um, once you know, and uh, I mean, they've created the awareness and at the same time, they've uh, sort of like, uh, informs people the reason why they want their data and it's also um, a credible agency that's managing the data. I don't think that should be a problem at all. Can I just get uh, the, Dr. G.D. Martins? What's your yes. question, please? Yes, I just want to sort of re-emphasize the need to take away the benefits of organized crime that is involving trafficking from them. So we need to do more in terms of getting property confiscated, property that has been acquired as a result of trafficking. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I just want to emphasize. Bearing in mind money laundry legislation in Nigeria and the need to improve or make provision for proceeds of crime acts, like we have in UK and other jurisdictions where somebody has been convicted of crime, and if the proceed of crime has been used to invest in property, especially trafficking, which is the focus of our, of our own discussion today, to make sure that you go after those property and confiscate it to the state. I know within the legislation, there is a victim of trafficking trust fund. We can go a long way by getting the proceeds of crime to be put on that victim of trafficking fund towards making resources available for rehabilitation. So the, the victims are also benefiting from the proceeds of crime which their perpetrator has illicitly gotten. So the, the, those are areas that I want the NAPTIV to um, direct more attention to. And um, I just want um, the, the, um, them, Julie, to emphasize on that because that will have a deterrence effect for people who are organized, who are involved in this kind of crime. You know, what extent is the, is the state going to making sure that proceeds of crime from this type of organized crime that has been legitimized through business or through other forms of money laundering mechanism? are taken away from them. Because if you don't take the crime away from them, then people will not see the need to be deterred. Those are the observations I just want to make. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I also have a question from um, Ayotola Ayeni. What's your question, please? She's probably not renamed assistant. Um, Ayotola Ayeni. Maybe I'll need to unmute everybody so that um, the person would uh, be able to let us know the question they would like to ask. And uh, maybe you came in late because everybody was yeah. like to themselves for How are we going to ensure that the person is going to change my phone and change my phone number? Can I ask a question? Right, OK. So, um, the, this is still in relation to uh, what we did last week. That particular one was not addressed. I wanted to know um, how people who were suffering from domestic violence would need to act. How would they conduct themselves, you know, in, in regards to the lockdown restrictions? There's nowhere to go. There's no one to turn to. So I was really interested. I was looking out for that. And I thought, I know that we did it last week. But I was hoping that even if it's just a two minute, one minute addressing of it, I'd really be grateful. Uh, maybe I'll probably uh, direct that question to Dame Julie. Would that be within your remit? Because I'm not sure whether we have um, a representative of the domestic sexual violence response team on here today. If she's there, she can take up the question because we had the director in, here last week. Inactive, actually. Okay. We, inactive, we have the violence persons prohibition act domicile with us so we we don't just um respond to cases of human trafficking we also respond to cases of um, domestic violence in the last two weeks we've right. had over 27 cases of um, violence you know i mean domestic violence especially we've also had cases of rape sodomy 
incest, you know, rape of little children and all of that, you know, in the last two weeks. So yes, there's somebody to report to. People mm -hmm. have been calling active and we've been responding. We are working 247. We are not on lockdown. We're actually working and then there's somewhere to go to. All right, then. Thank you very much. Uh, I have another question here. What is being done to prevent trafficking in the first place? Well, for well, me, place. prevention. Prevention is better than kill. We carry out massive sensitization all over the place, you know, not just in the urban areas, also in rural areas. We've also set up human trafficking task forces in states. Yes. Because we realize most of the states just think, sit back and think that it is a federal government affair. Mm -hmm. It's not a federal government affair. The state mm -hmm. governors have a role to play, massive role to play. Mm -hmm. Right now we have five states um, who have, you know, um, who's, who have, um, um, sorry, I'm trying to look for the right word to use, mm -hmm. who have inaugurated their task forces. Lagos State, we've mm -hmm. tried to reach the governor more than 100 times. We've not been able to get him to um to do that but we are willing anytime he's ready so mm -hmm. we're trying to uh, but for the lockdown we would have done like 10 12 states by now mm -hmm. but as soon as the lockdown is over we hope to go to all the states all 36 states to right. set up trafficking and uh, human trafficking task forces so that's uh, like a liaison between the states and the federal government it makes cooperation synergy a lot easier and mm -hmm. that way you know awareness and all of that we are also at the stage of infusing um the subject of human trafficking in the primary and secondary school curricula. We finish our work. All that is left is just for it to be infused, which we hope will be done hopefully this year. Yeah. You know, so yeah, we've done we've done all of that. Oh, good to know. Um, I was actually watching uh, a clip by uh, one of the Nollywood actresses, Omoni Oboli, regarding how one can. Um, you know, give signal out to say that you are in danger. I think this was something that I'd watched about four or five years ago in the States. There was this clip whereby you say you're ordering pizza and you're more or less giving some signs to whoever, you know, to the police that I'm in danger. Um, then Julie, do you, whilst you're creating the awareness in schools, you know, uh, which is a very good thing, it's a laudable idea. But the thing is, what about the local woman who sells pepper? What about the other man who sells meat? Do you localize this or, you know, in different dialects so that people know that, look, the grass is not greener on the other side. If somebody were to tell you that, oh, when I take you to a particular country, uh, you, you know, uh, the place is paved with gold, you do this, you do that. Do you sort of like localize it so that people will get a better understanding that there is danger in human trafficking? Absolutely. And you see, that is why the um, state task forces are very important because yeah. they know all the communities. So in carrying out the awareness programs, they do that in the local dialects yeah. and they can reach everybody. So yes, we have radio programs in various dialects and we also carry out this sensitization in various di dialects across the communities. Okay. Thank you very much. I have a question from uh, Yemi Fakejo. Can you ask your question, please? This is Jamie Fakarejo. I uh, just want to ask uh, about three questions. Wow. Uh, are, are, you, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, one from uh, Dame uh, Julie, uh, which has to do with um, the level of convictions that have been made um, in the past uh, from their commission uh, because of the fact that the, there's an increased level of uh, people who have been uh, trafficked abroad. Right. Quite a number of people, even those who have saloons in Nigeria, those who have who are petty traders, they look forward to going abroad. Mm. And um, if they do so, they are likely to fall into the hands of uh, traffickers. So, and for those that have been prosecuted, what is the level of conviction? That's question number one. Number two has to do with um, Honorable Abike Dabiri. Um, I'm concerned about. Um, the level of synergy between the commission uh, and and the aid, and the embassies mm -hmm. of those nations notorious for uh, you know either trafficking in, in in people and in effect they turn out to be Nigerians in diaspora, which eventually they they help to come back. Have you been speaking to the embassies 
as to, for instance, the embassy of Nigeria in, um, in Libya, as to what are you doing in terms of intelligence gathering towards ensuring that Nigerians are not in, their lives are not in jeopardy? Um, number three question goes uh, to... Let's just stay with two first. Uh, then, Judy, can you quickly answer yours and then Honorable Abike will answer hers. Then we take the third one quickly. Yes, so far we've been able to get um, 420 convictions. Um, we have so many cases in courts across Nigeria. And uh, the, on the issue of um, prosecuting Nigerians, yes, as much as possible, we try to prosecute Nigerians. The truth is that prosecution is a two-way thing. Those in the destination countries need to also prosecute those that collaborate with the, 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 the offenders in, in the countries of origin, which is in Nigeria. We've had a big problem with that because most of the time, the destination countries try to make it look like it's a Nigerian problem, and that is not so. So if they are not prosecuting those that come from the destination countries and we are just prosecuting ours, it's almost been like an exercise in futility because all that will happen is that those in destination countries will just carry on with new recruiters and, and it will just go on like that. So we are hoping that they will cooperate more with us going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Honorable Abike, can you quickly just ask, uh, answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. And by the way, Yemi Fakayajo, is my long lost brother from University of Lagos. Nice to see you here. I hope I get your number after this. Nice to okay. see you, Yemi. Yes, in, in terms of um, synergy, definitely, without the embassies, we can't do anything. Mm. We can't do anything. I mean, I don't, but you mentioned Libya. Libya is a war torn country. And we keep saying, just avoid the place like Libya. There are still many trapped people in Libya that you can't even get to them because it's a war torn zone. You can't even get there. When President Bright directed us to bring back Nigerians en masse, led by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, NAPTI, myself as SSA Immigration, and I were able to bring back, at a go, about 4,000 Nigerians trapped in Libya. And as I speak with you today, about 12,000 have returned through Nigerian government and the IOM. But there are places you can never get to. So Libya is a bit of a difficult area, but we have a, a mini mission there, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a war torn area, it's a problem area. However, like in Lebanon, is a big deal now. You hear a lot about Lebanon and all that. But it's like I said, trafficking basically is a adaptive issue. But when it comes to, oh, we're in trouble, let's do this. We'll work with the missions to see what we can do for them. So yes, definitely work with the missions. But the key thing is, as Madam Judy said, how can we prevent trafficking? When you look at the route, even as they get to Libya, how do they pass through those places? You know, so that's part of the problem of having this ECOWAS region where you can, you can travel without any visa, you can just travel with any document. Mm -hmm. So those are areas that has to be looked into, actually. How do they get to the, how the traffickers succeed? Take, for example, Saudi Arabia. If you notice, Saudi has stopped because Saudi embassy came up with the policy. They're not giving visas to, only to professionals. Mm -hmm. Now they move to Oman and Lebanon. So yes, definitely the embassies are key and the, all the agencies need to work together to, to, to achieve this. So thank you for that question. Thank you, um, Honorable Abike. Do you ha is your question a very uh, quick one? No, no, uh, it's a quick one. Um, uh, this, this goes to uh, Debbie Ario. Uh, well, maybe she may not be able to answer it, but um, she mentioned that uh, modern slavery is a control of person by another person. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the last couple of uh, weeks, we have been hearing stories about 5G network, uh, the issue of chips in the body, uh, which has to result into uh, control eventually. Uh, I, I was mm. just thinking in my mind that would this be something that our, our group will be looking into, you know, mm. because control of a person by another person, which could happen through advanced technology, uh, is also on the horizon. Absolutely. Um, thank you. That that's actually a very, very uh, important uh, uh, point to, to, to make. Uh, so that we're saying that the control of a person by another person, like they're controlling a thing, uh, is not just limited to physical contact. Technology is also playing a very key role, especially in relation to sexual, uh, sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children and adults, especially uh, women but even men and boys, to be sincere. So definitely online exploitation, uh, online slavery or sexual slavery, whatever you want to call it, is actually growing at a very alarming rate. Uh, and what people are seeing uh, is that under, uh, uh, whilst we are under this uh, 
the period where COVID-19 is limiting physical contact, mm -hmm. that we need to be very mindful that traffickers are going to move the operations online, you know, like TikTok and all that, and that people need to be very mindful of of you know uh, the children for example ch a lot of children now because they're not in school they're using uh, they're using uh, the internet to do work they, they have free access to the internet that parents need to be very mindful of what's going on with their children online so d definitely that's a very important question in the uk here it's a big issue um i've just done some research in thailand online trafficking is a big issue in thailand it's not something that Nigerians are talking about a lot now, but I have a strong uh, a suspicion that online uh, trafficking, uh, using technology, of course, uh, for sexual abuse and sexual exploitation is, uh, is, is, is happening in Nigeria. And if care is not taken, it will grow exponentially like it's growing uh, in, in Thailand and other countries in, the, in, the, uh, in Asia. So that's a very important question to raise. Thank you. Um, can I just bring in quickly bring in Carrie? Carrie, would you say that um, the introduction of this 5G, I think that was what Yemi uh, Fakayejo was saying, uh, introduction of the chips and everything else, would it be some sort of, uh, um, you know, a new dimension to uh, coercive control and maybe uh, would fall under modern day slavery? Is that what you're trying to say, uh, Yemi Fakayejo? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Will Carrie be able to answer that question quickly before sure. we round up? Yeah, no, I'll try and do it quickly. Yes, look, um, the point about um, human trafficking is, and any form of modern uh, day slavery is that there is it's um, mainly psychological, mainly, you know, any violence that is perpetrated by the traffickers is purely there to control and intimidate the uh, victims. Um, and, you know, we know that the smartphone, these things, which every one of us has, mm. nearly every vi victim of trafficking has one of these, uh, mm. but it's, it's, it's used to control them, not to access information and, 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 and assistance. It's there so that there is constant monitoring of what is going on, how they're uh, um, accessing um, uh, the public, um, you know, so chips, they're a bit expensive to be mm. putting into people, yeah. but that, you know, if that's, a, if that's a way of controlling people at distance, it will be used. Mm. But um, the, the, the most uh, use, usual form of control is just that good old psychological thing called the mind in which we have power relationships with the other and you know you establish that whether it's in the domestic environment or in the public environment you have got pretty much total control of your victim and that is why the psychologists have to be involved in the deprocessing of that uh, of that control malign control that's been established but you're right any form that can be manipulated and exploited will be used by traffickers and they you know what they're up to at the moment with covid we're not really clear but we do know as debbie pointed out they will be online we're online because yeah. we can't get into a conference center and be together and the traffickers will be exploiting their ability and they're way ahead often of the exploitation of online facilities using dark web using all sorts of forms uh, uh, being very disruptive but they will be always follow the money they will be making money out of it whatever they make money out of it, they will be using people to do so thank you so much carrie uh, i think we've come to the end of the discussion uh we overrun by some minutes here i'd like to thank everyone for taking part in this discussion most especially my uh guest uh dame julie Dame Julie Okadonli, I do thank you very much for taking the time out uh, to share uh, with us uh, what the agency does. The same thing with uh, Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa. Many thanks to you, uh, because I know you're a very busy lady as well. Um, I'd like to thank Carrie Pemberton Ford uh, for the insightful uh, discussion. I'd also like to thank um, Debbie Ario, the CEO of Afro 